All right, welcome everyone. Welcome all our Torah time viewers. So, uh, first of all, tonight we are learning Le'iluni Shmat Rabbi Avram ben Abchaim Yehuda and Yechezkel ben Rabbi Avram. So, tonight, oh my gosh, it's going to be so good if I do a somewhat of a decent job. Um, so it all depends on how much of a good job HaKadosh Baruch Hu provides me the assistance to be able to do. But this stuff is, uh, it's gold. It's gold what, what, what we're going to be able to share tonight. So the focus of what we're going to be trying to do, I, I wanted to try to do all the simanim in one share. I realized that it's not possible for me to uh, to really do it in in one, so I'm going to split it. Uh, when we'll do the next one, we'll see. When Mashiach comes, maybe. Um, uh, uh, next year, or if not, then we'll do Bezal Hashem next year. Now, the focus that I want to do tonight is the four simanim, and that is uh, the apple and the honey. Um, which we spoke kind of a little bit, well, kind of a lot last week, but it's going to be a, on a, a, a on a little bit of a different angle, but mostly on the same angle, if that can make any sense. And then I want to speak about three other simanim, and that is the leak of the cabbage that the Yiratzen is Yiratzen Lovanecha Hashem Lekin Lekev Sinu Shi Karsu Seinenu that Hakadosh Baruch Hu should destroy our uh, the people that hate us Seinenu. Then on dates Yiratzen Lovanecha Hashem Lekin Lekev Sinu Shi Tamu Seinenu that our those that hate us should perish. And finally Yiratzen Lovanecha Hashem Lekin Lekev Sinu. This is on beat Shi Stalku Ayvenu that our uh, enemies should be removed. Those are the four that I want to uh, the touch base. Now, we have to understand the aspects of this Yehira Atzad, right? So, the three out of the four that I just mentioned is that our enemies will be destroyed. So we're eating leek, or we're eating cabbage, and we're saying we're eating this, that our enemies should be destroyed. Or we're eating a date, that our enemies should perish. Or uh, we're eating beets, that our enemies should be uh, should be removed. I said enemies too many times. Really, Sanenu is those that hate us. Ivenu is our enemies. But in any case, when you think about it, like, is this, is this a good war tactic? Uh, you know, imagine you go to a general, and a general is about to go into the war, and you see a whole spread in front of him. And, you know, the, the president is going over to the general and be like, what are you doing? You have to go out of war. And be like, don't worry, I got this. A little bit of dates, a little bit of beets, a little bit of cabbage, and all my enemies are going to be uh, destroyed. The king is going to be like, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? It's like, oh, and fight. What is, so how are we to understand this? So we're coming on Rosh Hashanah. This is the, one of the holiest days of the year. We're coming to Rosh Hashanah, and instead of going and fighting whatever it is with our enemies, we are eating fruit, saying, yi ratzon, and saying, yeah, may, uh, may everything be destroyed. Seems to be, like, amazing. Like, why don't we do this for everything? So there was uh, the Dibbut Maga brings an exa- brings a story to bring this point even further. There was a poor man that was invited to eat a meal at a home of a wealthy man, and he was like amazed by all the luxuries that this man had. And what really impressed him the most, besides the beautiful palace and uh, you know the 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 silverware, the chandeliers, the carpets, what really amazed him is he had this little bell that was sitting right next to him during the meal. And every time he dinged the bell, every time he rang the bell, all of a sudden, a ton of waiters come out from all direction, and they re- there, there are waiters that remove the used plates, and they, there's other waiters that come and bring the, fresh, the next course of fresh fruit. And he was amazed. Every time that he dinged the bell, this scenario repeated it- itself. And he's never seen this before in his life. After he leaves this rich man's house, he decides, like, I got to get my hands on one of these buzzers, on one of these, on one of these bells. So he goes over to the bell store, and he, go, he goes and he starts looking at all the bells. I said, I want your most expensive, fanciest bell. So this guy's looking. This owner is looking. This guy is in rags. This guy's, you know, that. He wants the most expensive bell. He starts showing him some of the lower class stuff. He says, no, 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 no. I don't want this fake silver stuff. Give me the gold. Give me the most expensive stuff. I'll save up and I'll buy whatever it costs. So he presents him this beautiful golden, like, like a bell with jewels all over it. He says, this is the most expensive. You want the most expensive bell? Here it is. And he says, I'll take it. He mortgages everything. He buys a bell. He comes home that night. He calls his family all around the table. And he tells his family, you're not going to believe what I just pur- purchased. Our hunger, that's going to end. Our poverty, that's going to My solution is right here, right now in this bell. And they're all looking at this, you know, seemingly fancy bell. But like, what could it really do? And he sits over there. 
makes himself sit up tall and he dings the bell. And everybody's watching him and he's just waiting. And then he's like opening his eyes and he's looking around. He sees nothing is happening and he dings it again. And he starts looking around. You know what happens when, when you start looking around? Other people start looking around. So his whole family starts looking like, who are you waiting for? Like, what, what's happening? And he goes again and again. He starts dinking and dinking and dinking. And nothing is happening. And the family's like, what's going on? He's like, I don't know. It's not working. He runs back to the bell store. And he says, you gave me a defective bell. I paid so much for this bell. He's like, what are you talking about? They put the bell on the table. The owner bing, dings it. It makes a sound. That's all that it's supposed to do. And he looks over at him and says, it works perfectly fine. He says, no, what are you kidding me? He says, I was by this rich man's house. And he had a bell not even close to as fancy as this one. And he would ding it. And every time that he would ring it, Dozens of waiters and servants came in from all directions and served him. And all of a sudden, the store owner started laughing and he started realizing what was going on over here. And he says, do you think the bell has any power? Do you think the bell has the ability to summon the servants? This rich man has a lot of money. He hired servants. The bell is only the one that signifies of rings of when they should come. Says the Dubna Magad, if you're coming to Rosh Hashanah and you think that the foods themselves are going to bring you a good year, then you're like this poor man who's thinking and saying, oh, you know what? I don't need to learn. I'll eat a pomegranate. I'll, I don't need to worry about my enemies. I'll eat a date, I'll, do, I'll figure out a few things over here of the Hirat sense, and I'm settled, I'm done. But rather, what is the focus over here? The focus is not the food, the focus is rather the Hirat zone. And Rav Yaakov Emden writes in his Siddur that the Jewish people have tremendous power. Where does, where does the Jewish person have the power? It's in their mouth. They have the ability to go and have the power in their mouth, and that is the power of, feel of the power of Tyra. It, and this also goes, for example, in dreams. If someone has a dream, it's the way that you interpret it, that's the way that the dream is going to come out. So if you interpret it for good, the dream is good. You interpret it for bad, the dream is bad. So it all depends on the mouth. It all depends on your interpretation. So too over here, it all depends on the Yehi now we have to start and stop for a second and think, wait a minute, the he is so powerful, this sounds a little bit heebie-jeebie, is this okay in the kosher world? Like, you know, we're not supposed to do anything that's close to, to uh, witchcraft or sorcery. It sounds like, what, are we going to say something over here over this spellbound food and then everything is going to be okay? So the Gemara actually teaches and says that a king has to be anointed at spring. Why? Because it symbolizes a new rain. The spring is when everything becomes rejuvenated, everything starts blossoming, everything starts growing. And that's why the king also goes and gets anointed during the spring because it's like a new, a new rain and it should flow like the spring. And Rav Ami in the Gemara teaches that you can, you shouldn't, but you can divine to see if you're going to survive the year or you're going to survive a, a voyage, you know, overseas. The Gemara says you shouldn't do this. There is a way to do it. You shouldn't do it, but you're, you could do it. Why shouldn't you do it? Because if you discover unfortunate information, the emotional pain can make the matter worse. But we see over here, it's very clear from the Gemara, that symbolism while it's not witchcraft, while it's not sorcery, it's symbolism. Symbolism is significant and it's not considered sorcery. And Abaya does say in the Gemara that in the beginning of a new year, by Rosh Hashanah, you're supposed to eat fruits that provide positive symbolism. And this is indeed recorded in the Shulchan Aruch. And this is the common practice today that after Shul, on, some people do it the first night, some people do it on both nights, you come home and the table is set or you're setting the table with all these different fruits and you go through the machzer and you say the he ratzon by each fruit. Says the Shlach HaKadosh, what is the focus? So the focus is really the Hiratzon, but he says the focus is even greater than that. The focus is not just what you say with the Hiratzon, but the focus is supposed to in, in, inspire you to repent and to pray. And that is the focus of the Simanim. The main purpose is for inspiration and prayer. And in fact, the Mishnah Brewer brings down that when one is saying the Hiratzon, you should say them with sincerity and you should arouse yourself during that time to do tshuva to repent. In addition, Adam Arishan ate from the Eitz Adas on Rosh Hashanah to repair some of the damage that was done by his mouth on the same day, we use our mouth on Rosh Hashanah for a mitzvah. That's so why we eat a meal in honor of Yom Tov. We daven. You know, if our, you know for, the, for the holy day, we use our mouth for good things. And that's why on Rosh Hashanah night, we eat the simanim with the hiratzah, with the prayers before them, to combine that aspect in, uh, in, in, in fixing that, to some extent, the avera of Adam Arishan. Rav Moshe Sternbach says that even if you go to the table 
and you do this in Manem, but you have no idea. Let's say you, you listen to this class, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You probably will. But if you have no idea what I'm talking about and you're coming over there and you're still doing it, it's still valued at something. Meaning that even if you don't do all the chuvah, and even if you don't do that, it's still valued at something. There was a, uh, a woman that once came to Reb- Rebetzin Kanievsky. And uh, she needed advice, she needed a bracha. She was close to giving birth, and the doctors told her that the baby was lying in a breech position. The baby was not lying in a, uh, uh, in a position that was conducive for a healthy and normal birth. So, Rebetzin Kanievsky told this woman, go home and make sure all your sefarim, all your, your holy books, are right side up, right? Because just like you want the baby to come the right side up, so to, meaning the right way out, so too you have to make sure that all your sefarim, all your holy books, are right side up. However, this woman didn't hear clearly what the Rebetzin was saying, and the word sefarim is very close to the word sirim. Sefarim means book, sirim means pots. This woman thought the Rebetzin Kanievsky said, go, to your house and make sure all your pots are right side up. So this woman went home. The Rebetzin said something. So the, Rebbe, the woman went home and she goes to all her pots and she makes sure that they're right side up. And she opens up her Pesach kitchen and she makes sure that all her Pesach pots are also right side up. And lo and behold, she goes back to the doctor and the baby is no longer in a breech position and the baby is ready to be born naturally and healthy. After she gave birth to a healthy baby, she told this school to all her friends, she says, you're not going to believe it. I went to the Rebbe Zekamiyaski and she said that you have to make sure that all the pots are right side up. And I, I did that and the baby came out at you. And the kid, and the, all, they started laughing. He says, you did what? All her friends, he says, you, you put the pots right side up. What should I have pot? What, what connection does pots have? And she was like, yeah, that's what the, that's what the Rebbe said, said. Put the pots the right side up. And they went over to the Rebbe said and said, you know, like, you know, does this? Did you tell her that all the pots should be right side up, and that's why? And she listened to it. She says, "I didn't say pots. I said, I said sefarim. I didn't say sirim. I said sefarim. Sefarim is is um, is books. Is the holy books." So when she heard this, that what she did with the pots, and that it worked, she went over to Reb Chaim Kanievsky, her husband, and told her uh, and told him this. And he responded with a story from Gemara in Psachim, where there was a rabbi by the name of Masna, who he quoted from, he was giving a drasha, he giving a speech in his town, he quoted from Rabbi Yehuda, he said that women that are needing dough for matzos, they should use something called Mayim Shalanu. Mayim Shalanu is literally a water that was rested overnight, but the literal translation of Mayim Shalanu means our water, my water. So the woman that heard this speech thought that in order to bake matzahs, we need to use Rav Masna's water. Rav Masna says, my, shalom, my water. So they went and they lined up to take, to take the water uh, from, from Rav Masna. Rav Yisrael Salam to ask, why is the Gemara relating the story? Like to show us that the women were ignorant and they didn't know that it had to be with the, that water was, that was left overnight and not water that belonged to the rabbi? On contrary, says Rabbi Yisrael, he said that this is, shows the exceptional emunas hachamim of women. Even though they didn't understand, even though it didn't make any sense, they were willing to comply with Rav Masna's instructions. Rav Chaim goes over to his wife and explains that certainly the merit, how, how did it happen that this, she turns over her pots and the baby all of a sudden becomes right? So it wasn't the merit of turning the pots over. It had nothing to do with anything. The pots has nothing to do with anything. But rather, it was the power of emunas hachamim, or power that she said, this is what the Rebetzin said. The Rebetzin is a holy person. She spends her life going and getting close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu doing everything for Klal Yisrael. He says, if this is what the Rebbe and Kanievsky said, then this is what I'm going to do. The fact, the power of our Amun HaSachamim, that has the power to go and change the baby's position to be born healthy, in a healthy manner. And this explains Reb Chaim, this is the power that even if you go to something, we have minhagim, we have things that we do, and you maybe don't understand it. Hopefully tonight you're going to understand a little bit better. But even if you don't understand it, the power still lies that you're saying that Chachamim told you to do this, and I'm doing it. I'm not asking any question. That itself has the power to give you that salvation, that Yeshua. So now, with that introduction, let us begin with uh, the first, usually what people do the first, is the apple in uh, the honey. This is a fairish uh, a song that is almost required for if you have any children that they sing by the table. I dip the apple in the honey. And uh, you make the Bari Priya 8, and then you make the Yiratsun Milfanecha Hashem Al Kinavakia Vasinu, Shitachadish Alenu Shana Tova Umetuka. You can uh, you, you ask Akadish Baruch who you dip the apple in the honey, you say that you should Akadish Baruch Hu should renew for us a good year that is sweet. So Vayagid Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Greenwald. 
So what is good and what is sweet? So we gave an interpretation last week and we're gonna be continuing on that theme but not directly on that theme. And good represents the Torah. Sweet represents material needs, says uh, Rev. Yaakov Greenwald. So let's take this a step for, further. When you, you look at the bracha that you make on the apple and the honey, you make a bracha by your prey eights on the apple. You don't make a bracha on the honey. Now, why? Why is it that you make a bracha on the apple and you don't make a bracha on the honey? The honey makes everything very sweet. And the answer is because apple is the symbol of, the symbol of life itself. It comes from a tree. It's life. And not only that, it's, 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 it's compares to Torah, what we just said. The apple is the Torah the, and, the, and the honey is the material needs. So the apple is the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. That we are Chaim Chaim This is the tree of life that we hold on. This is the life itself. We make the bracha on the Torah. That's the life. Now listen to this beautiful story that brings out this point. There was a student that came over to the, yesh- the founder of the Velazhenar Yeshiva, Rabbi Chaim Velazhenar. And he asked him advice about a shidduch that he was read. And this particular family that he, that he was, uh, set, was going to be set up with was a man that became very recently extremely wealthy, like overnight. And this man promised that if he marries his daughter, because he wanted to look at top yeshiva bachar, he says, if you marry my daughter, I'm going to support you, and I'm going to give you everything, and you'll be able to sit and learn. So now this boy goes over to the rabbi and says, I don't know what to do about this shidduch. Yes, he promised the support, and I'll be able to sit and learn. But this man, he's, you know, he's not this refined, wealthy man of midos. And he, you know, he's extremely coarse. He's very vulgar, despite his great wealth. What should I do? Should I continue and marry into this family, knowing what the father-in-law will be? Or is it better not to, even though... Though at the same point in time, you know, he will support me and I would be able to learn. So Reb Chaim replied with a story. He said in Lithuania, there was a dish that was very popular. The dish was cucumber fried in honey. And Reb Chaim Velazhenar asks this boy, you know how this came about? The boy says, no, no idea. He said that the cucumber desired to marry the honey. So he sent a shot and he says, do me a favor. He says, I see the honey. I like the honey. The honey has good meadows. The honey has everything going for her. I, do me a favor. I want to marry the honey. So the shot goes over to the honey and he says, you know, listen, the cucumber wants to marry the honey. And the honey looks at the shot and he says, the cucumber? He says, the honey, me, the honey? We're complete opposites. How can you even do it? I says, I am light. He is dark. I am soft. He is hard. He's bitter. I'm very sweet. He says, how am I? We're two complete opposites. Why should the honey marry to the cucumber? So the cucumber was very persistent. And he said, no, don't worry about it. I'll change. You think I'm dark? I'll peel myself. I'll peel my dark skin. You think I'm hard? I'll chop myself up into tiny pieces. Oh, and I'm bitter? He says, I'll go and I'll fry myself in honey. I'll fry myself in you. The honey hears this. He says, listen, you know, you have a guy over here that's willing to do so much for me. He says, you know what? Fine. He goes, she goes, and she says, I'll marry, I'll marry the honey. After the wedding, the question arose, which bracha should be made over the dish? Meaning, was it going to be hadama on the cucumber? Because that would be taking precedence. Or be shahakal for the honey? So, it all depends on what's the right, what's the, what, what, what's the most over here. And we know over here, the, the, what's considered the most important ingredient in the, in the cucumber and the honey mix, that's going to be the cucumber. So the decision was made that the cucumber is the main ingredient, and hence the bracha for this dish would be hadama. Reb Chaim Velazhenar goes over to the student and he says, you see, even though the cucumber attempted to be humble, attempted to pizza the honey, attempted to change himself, but he remained the dominant partner. The Rosh Shiva did not give him an answer on what to do to marry this family or not, but the man just realized where the Rosh Shiva was going for, and he decided that he's not, he's going to refuse the proposal, the rich man's proposal. But what do we see from here? We see over here that what bracha you make, what blessing you make, determines what is primary in that dish. So when we look at the dip the apple in the honey, what is the primary? Is the honey the primary or is the apple the primary? And we see over here that the bracha that we make is bari pre ace, which shows us that the apple is the primary. That is that we just started off saying that what that the Torah is the apple and the physical pleasures, the physical needs is this is the honey. We see over here that the Torah, the apple, that is our first concern, and that takes precedence over our worldly values. And Chazal say in the Mishnah in Perkei office, that whoever accepts upon himself or herself all Torah, the yoke of Torah, will have all machos, the, the yoke of the government, removed from them. What does that mean? So it says not only does it mean the, the, the 
the yoke of the physical kingship, but it also means the yoke of the Melech Malchi Amlachim, the king in Shemayim. Meaning that if a person goes and puts himself on himself the all of Torah, the learning of the Torah, then he saves himself or herself from the judgment, not only in this world, from the, from the king in this world, but also the king in the next world will not judge that person that delves into uh, Torah. And this was a, there was a story in, in Raden and during the time of the Chafetz Chaim, where there was a boy who was learning in Yeshiva, he learned well, but he just, for whatever reason, reason he wouldn't put on fillin. He just didn't put on fillin. And they wanted to throw the boy out of Yeshiva. And they went over to the Chavetz Chaim and they said, we, we got to throw him out. He doesn't put on fillin. Like, this guy is sitting there and he's not even putting on fillin. And the Chavetz Chaim says, no, he's learning. He's, in, he's immersed in his learning. They should let him stay. And the Meshkiach said, this is how they work in heaven also. If you are immersed in learning, you too will be speared from the heavenly judgment. Listen to the story I read from Rabbi Shlomo Levenstein. That this story was said directly to him. There was a couple that unfortunately couldn't have any children. And they went from doctor to doctor, from specialist to specialist, from, uh, you know, fertility, you know, centers to, to another. And they ended up in the fertility department in Soroka Medical Center. And they were sat over there with the director of that department. And he looks at them and he says, listen, he says, after all these series of tests and treatments that we, you know, that we have done on you, and, and he, he goes and he says, he starts shaking his head. He said, you know, I'm afraid that you're going to have to make peace with reality. You have not one issue. You have multiple issues. And you combine that one on top of another, th- th- there's never going to be a chance that you're going to be able to be your own children. He says, quit trying. Quit wasting your time. The chances of you bearing a child is practically zero. And the couple is hearing this. And what couple? No couple wants to hear such a thing. They were willing to go and, you know, they put money on the side for, for expensive treatments. And, they, and when they hear this, they were completely crushed. So they didn't know what to do. They went over to their Rav. And the Rav says, go over to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. So they went to visit Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And they told the Rav, they told the rabbi their entire story. So Rav Chaim hears a story. Then he looks at the man and asks a seemingly unrelated question. He says, do you set time for Torah study each day? And uh, the man was like taken aback. He says, we're talking one second over here about, you know, infertility and problems with, you know, childbirth. And he's asking about learning Torah. And he says, yeah, you know, I, I learned. And Reb Chaim wasn't happy with the answer. He says, you know, like, he says, no, no, no. He says, he questioned him again. He says, every day you make sure that you set time to learn Torah? And the guy was thinking, he says, you know, every day, I mean, I try to learn whatever I can, but like the set time, probably twice a week. Twice a week, I have a genuine fixed schedule, fixed learning session twice a week. So Rab Chaim looks at him and he says, make sure that you learn every single day and you will have children. And with that, they left. They left. They, they, there was a, a, a new life that was coursing through their veins. There was genuine hope at this point in time. And they were even debating, like, is there even a point of continuing treatment? Like the tzaddik, the Gadol Adar just gave them a blessing that they're going to have children. They decided they're gonna, not going to go further with any more treatment anymore, but they decided that they're, he is going to go and make sure that he learns every single day. He was working at this time in Demona, a city in Israel, and he walked into a nearby kolo, and he went over to the Rosh Kolo, and he said, can you do me a favor? Can you set me up with one of the people over here to learn every single day during my lunch break? And the rabbi in charge says, you know, absolutely. He went and looked around. He picked one guy, and they set up, and they started learning every single day during this guy's lunch break. They learned religiously for one month. One month. Four weeks go by, and they hear the wonderful news that this woman was expecting. They were in heaven. They were shedding tears of happiness and joy. They were blessing Hashem day and night. About a few months go in to the pregnancy, and this man kept up his daily Torah study, uh, but he didn't realize about really how critical it was for him. During about the fourth month of pregnancy, he became preoccupied and he forgot learning for one day. And in that same day, like failure just suddenly struck. His wife fell ill. They had to rush her to the, you know, to the hospital and he started plugging the two together. He says, wait a minute, I, didn't, I wasn't learning today and this is what all of a sudden happened. He called the Rosh Kala, he didn't call her Prime. He called the Rosh Kala, says, what should I do? I missed the learning and this is what happened. So the, the, the Rosh Kala said, the rabbi said, go and quickly make up the time that you miss and make sure that you don't, you don't miss any more time. So he learned his lesson. He went and he made sure that he didn't miss a day and he made it up. As soon as he made it up, all of a sudden, as instantly as it came, it, as quickly it dissipated all the problems. From then on, he made sure never to miss a day of learning. 
A few months later, his, he, he, his first son was, was born. A short while after that, his employer moved him to a different location, and he couldn't find his chavrusa that he had up there, so he, he learned, you know, he made sure to learn, but, you know, he wasn't learning as, as religiously as he was before. Two years go by, and, you know, he still wanted his family to grow, and nothing is happening, and he remembers what Reb Chaim Ganefsky told him, so he calls back to the Rosh Hashiva in Demona, and he says, you've got to help me out over here. He says, I'm living in, I'm, I'm working in this city. I don't work there anymore. I need to find a, a, a learning partner, a chavrusa. So the Rashiva, the Rosh Kala over there makes a few phone calls and sets him up with a chavrusa. Listen to this. He's learning for one month. His wife is expecting again. As the due date gets closer, the, there's something that looks off with the baby's brain. Uh, they say that, you know, the chances of being a healthy baby was very slim. So he goes over to Reb Chaim. At this point in time, he's learning every single day. And Reb Chaim gives him a bracha and says, don't worry about it. The baby's going to be born healthy. A few months later, the baby is born, a girl, completely in perfect health. But a little bit after that, after a second kid, the Yitzhahara, Sahara, the evil inclination, took hold of him. And he kept on learning, but he ended up, you know, skipping usually every Friday. It was very busy. Friday is a very busy day. It's a hard day. You have to prepare for Shabbos. You finish your work. You have, there's a lot of things going on. And he stopped learning on Friday. And two years again passed. And then he was like, listen, he had two kids. He wanted more. They wanted a bigger family. And they realized he wasn't learning on Friday. So he immediately went back to learning every single day. Again, shortly after that, his wife was expecting again. This is the third, the third child, and again, short, nine months later, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. And he realized the importance of learning Torah on a daily, on a daily, day to day. He continues learning this, and then his wife gets pregnant for the fourth time. This is a woman who had zero chance of ha- getting pregnant. And this, uh, this woman was, uh, when she was pregnant, they said that there's something wrong with the baby. They did think the baby, unfortunately, is going to come out Down syndrome. So they went back to Reb Chaim. If Reb Chaim gave him a bracha, he says, don't worry about it, continue learning, the baby's going to be born completely healthy. They went and they continued learning, and the baby girl was born completely, oh, sorry, it was a boy, the boy was the fourth, the fourth child was a boy, was born completely healthy. Look at the power of learning Torah. There's also the power of the tzaddik, of Reb Chaim Kanievsky. You see the power of what Torah has, what things are impossible, through the kaya chatayra, through the power of Torah, makes the impossible possible. And this is, says the Devrayal, that this, why is the Jewish people compared to an apple tree? Because an apple tree produces fruit before its leaves sprout. And just like Klal Yisrael, Naseb and Ishmael, when we were about to accept the Torah, we said, we don't care what's inside, we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to do it. We accepted the Torah. So too, we go to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says, just like we accepted the Torah, the power that has to change the possible, for the, for the impossible to the possible, just like that, we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Naseb and Ishmael, so too you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please, before we even ask for something, please fulfill our desires before we utter them. Another few reasons of why we dip the apple in the honey, we, uh, um, the, you know, everything that happens to anyone, we know, everything that Kedush Baruch Hu does is for the best. And what does Nachum Ish Gamzu says? Nachum, that was Rabbi Akiva. Nachum Ish Gamzu, his Rabbi, would say, Gamzu Latava, everything is for the best. What does that mean that everything is for the best? Even the bad and even the good, all that's for the best. But when we ask Kedush Baruch Hu that we want to have a good, sweet year, Shana Tovah, Mituka, what does that mean, a good, sweet year? Yes, good, everything is good. Kalman da Avru Rechman Al-Tavavit, Gamzu Latava, everything is good. But when we dip the apple in the honey, we say, not only do we want it good, we want it to be sweet, meaning that we want it to be unmistakably good. We, we want to be able to see the good right then, right there, right now. We don't want to wait for later to see or look back. Oh, that's why the difficulties were good. We want the good and the full good and only no good and nothing but the good. Uh, in a sweet way. Rav Nassim Gestetner, he takes it in a little bit of a different angle and says that Taisvis says that apples are extras. They're not necessary foods. They're created for enjoyment. Yes, they have nutritional value and yes, they have, but they're created for, for enjoyment. Explains Rav Nassim Gestetter that the, uh, just like these apples are extra, we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu, don't just provide us for our basic necessities. We dip the apple in the honey, please HaKadosh Baruch Hu, give us even, even the extras. So that what we see from the apple. The apple represents our physical needs and it represents our spiritual needs. But what starts off, it starts off with the apple and that is the spiritual, that's what, that's what our focus should be. Now, let's go on to the other three me um, resins that we want to, to, to go over tonight. So the first one is on leaker cabbage. 
We say Yira Tzim Lefanecha Hashem Al Kedem Al Kedem Asenu She Karusu Seneinu We eat leek or cabbage, and we say that Hakadosh Baruch Hu should destroy Seneinu those who hate us. Let's try to understand. We're going to be saying Seneinu twice and Oivenu our enemies once. What is who we are referring to when we're saying our enemies? Who are we referring to when we're saying we're, we're saying the people that hate us? So. We're going to give a few answers to, uh, to what they are. I believe we're going to give six answers to what they are. Number one, it's referring to the, the other nations of the world who hate us. This is not referring to a Jew that you have some sort of issue against another fellow Jew. Even if the Jew is sinful, one should not intend to pray that harm should befall another Jew. Even if that person has wronged this person, even if the person has stole, stolen from this person, this person has hurt this person, harmed this person, embarrassed, whatever the other Jew has done, we do not ask for the downfall, for the destruction of another Jew. Hashem responds measure for measure. If a person overlooks those who hated or wronged, wrong them, so to HaKadosh Baruch Hu will, will excuse the person's wrongdoing. So when we say our enemies, we're not referring to Jewish enemies, we're not refer- we don't have any Jewish enemies, we're referring to, referring to enemies that hate the Jewish nation, enemies that, and, and in fact there's a, a Rav, and I don't remember who it was, that said if you hate the Jewish nation, that means you hate HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because that's what we represent, we're, we, and what we should represent, Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So we, this, the Oivenu, the Seinenu, our enemies, the people that hate us, this is referring to the other nations of the world that hate us. So that is number one. Number two, the 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 enemies, the ones that hate us, this is referring to our corrupt objectives. This is a mindset of corruption that we have and that is considered our enemies. Number three is our sins. Our sins, and we'll soon see why, this is, this is also considered our enemies and the people that, that hate us. The, uh, the fourth one is there are angels that are created by our sins. And every time someone's in, there's an angel, there's a prosecutor, there's a celestial prosecutor that is created. And that causes the person that created this angel, the sinner, tremendous amount of suffering. So we pray that these are the, these angels, these beings that we created with our sins, they don't like us. They want to create damage to us. We want them to be eliminated. We want them to be destroyed. The, that was the fourth. The fifth is the Satan. The Satan and his entourage and everyone that he has working for him that wants to make us sin, that is referring to that. And the sixth, which is also under the same category, is the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. So what is the what what is the Sihir Ratzan? The Sihir Ratzan is she karsu seneno. This is regarding to leek or cabbage. What is she karsu? She karsu comes from the from the root kares. Kares means to cut off. We want to dissever, to disconnect the, the these people that hate us. So let's look at it for example, our 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 Averas. When somebody unfortunately makes a, a sin, they create an angel. This angel now has the power to cause harm to this person. So how does this person, there's sort of a connection between this person and and this angel. Now this angel connects itself, let's say, to an enemy of this person, uh, someone who against the Jewish people, and gives them the power, so to, so to speak, to harm, sort of like in a triangle, to harm this, to harm the person that sinned. So there is a connection between the person, the angel, and the enemy. And we're asking Shikar, so Karis means to cut off. We want to cut off that, that connection that this angel that we created, unfortunately, through our sins, should not have the power of the ability to go and, and give power to our enemies to go and to harm us and to hurt, uh, to hurt us. And we want all connections to be severed. This is that the connection between us and the, the sin, between us and the angel, between us and the enemy, between us and the people that hate us. We want all completely, uh, um, you know, uh, disconnected. And along these lines, we look at the next two. The next two, when you eat the dates, she tamu sainenu, that the, those that hate us should perish. What is what is the difference over here? Those that hate us should perish over here. There was a low-ranking uh, member of the king's court that committed a terrible crime. And they've been found that they were guilty of murder. All signs pointed to this person. And this person, you know, was convicted and he realized that that's it. You know, like he did something wrong. He's going to get punished by the king. But instead of the king punishing him, the king uh, reviews his all his account and decides that they're going to promote him. He goes from a low minister and they start bringing him to higher minister ministerial positions. And every few weeks he keeps on growing higher and higher and his minister cannot believe his good luck. You know, he cannot believe, you know, and all of a sudden you get all this power, it gets to your head. You know, and he, he keeps on getting more and more powerful, more and more money, more and more, you know, higher in the, in, you know, in the government position until he's appointed viceroy. He's appointed to the second most powerful person in the kingdom, second to none other than the king himself. 
and he's sitting over there with his arrogance and he's got everything going for him and all of a sudden he's sitting over there in his pride and glory that the king all of a sudden goes and orders his execution at the height of his fame, at the height of his power. Explains that Rav Baruch of Kasev, that this is based on the Gemara and Gitin, that what happens when the when the, you have nations of the world that go and harass the Jewish people? You know what Hakadosh Baruch Hu does with them? He raises them up. He brings them up. They go against the Jewish people. He re, he raises the them up. He brings them up because when the Jewish people, how are the Jewish people have the ability to to be harassed if they do averus, if they do sin, if we don't follow the way of the Torah, we don't follow the way of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Hakadosh Baruch Hu gives the power to these to the nations of the world to go and harm us. And they raise and raise and raise until they get to a certain level and that's when HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes and HaKadosh Baruch Hu punishes them. You only need to look at the history and look at all the nations of the world that went against the Jews. These nations, no law, I mean, this is already, I, I don't know how many times you have to call it a scientific fact. They are no longer a, a blimp on the radar. They're no longer there. You Babylon, what's Babylon? Iraq, Iran, you know, Greece, all these countries are null and void. They're they're like they're, they're besides filing for bankruptcy again and again. You know, like they're, 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 there's nothing to, towards them. Makadish Baruch raises them. They go and they they do their bidding and then they get destroyed. So when we ask Hakadish Baruch when we ask Hakadish Baruch Hu, you know, she tamusenenu that Hakadish Baruch we want them to perish, even the ones that are very very high up. When they're very high up, when they perish, it destroys the economy. It destroys a lot. It does. It has a rippling effect. We say, regardless, Hakadosh Baruch we're saying over here in this Yehi that they should perish no matter what it is. Let them be destroyed completely. And this is the Meiri goes and says this is also this is reference to our sin. How is it a reference to our sin? When someone does an avera, when someone does a sin, and the, the Mishnah tells us avera gereres avera. When someone does a bad deed, that produces the ability to to make another bad deed. Meaning, if you do something bad, now it's easier for you to fall again. And if you fall again, it becomes even easier for you to fall again. The more bad that you do, you're sort of like a snowballing effect. You start a, snow, a little snowball on top of the mountain. If it's the right snow, you know, it, it, as it rolls down, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. When you do a, a, a bad deed, when you do an avera, when you do a sin, the first time it may be difficult. The next time it becomes easier. Meaning you're more likely, the more that you sin, the more likely you're going to continue this to sin. Akadish Baruch is going to give you more opportunities to sin. And the, the, the flip side is also true. If if you do a mitzvah, in the beginning it might be very hard, but as soon as you start doing one good deed, you, it's a snowball effect. Now this Baruch is going to give you an opportunity to do another good deed, and it's going to become easier. And the more good deeds that you do, the snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger and becomes easier to do. So the Meiri says that we want this, our sins, we want, this is referring to uh, uh, the Sainino, the, people, the, the ones that hate us. Who's the one that hate us? That are our sins. The sins, the ones that we create, the angels. We want them to completely perish. We don't want them to have any power to go and compound and to make more sins, more likely more viable. So this is what we're asking, that they perish and should not bring any more Averas. And finally, we ask for the uh, the slika the the beats we we say that they should remove our enemies should be removed now this is a different that we're using a different word over here until now we used sainenu those that hate us now we're using aivenu aivenu are our enemies are very different things and in fact an uh, and an Ayvenu, an Ayev, an enemy is worse than a sona you have an enemy and then someone who hates you. What do you think is worse? Someone who hates you is one as one level, but enemy is a whole nother a whole nother uh, level. So, so explains the Rabbeinu Bachya. Why, why is an enemy an ayev called an ayev? Because the, it stems from they wanted to cause you so much problems, so much damage that you krechts, that you sigh like ayev. Ayev is from like ayev, like you know, like you're you're like you're you're sighing with the 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 difficulties that the enemy wants to go on to you, and that's why the enemy is is greater. So we're asking Hakadosh Baruch Hu to help us. Where does the Ayvenu, where do our enemies get our power from? So remember we said that we first we have the Sainenu, we have the, the sins that cause us, the, that, that gives power to what? To our enemies to go and to harm us. So we have a sin and that sin gives powers to the to these celestial angels that don't like us, they hate us, they want to cause us damage and they give the power to the enemies and the enemies now have the power to overcome us. We asking us that, that watch ye stalku Ayvenu, that you should remove our enemies. We we should no longer have. They should no longer have that power to connect us. They should know to our sins that would give us the, to give them the power to go and cause us damage, cause us harm. So where does this all stem from? This all stems from that we shouldn't have any more usurm, any more, any more difficulty. So we see over here something very interesting. 
we see over here that we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we did a sin. And the sin goes, and whether you look at Oivenu or Seinenu, we have, we, we created a sin. This sin creates an angel. This angel does not like that it was created and it wants to cause the creator of that sin damage and harm. So either it does it through himself, it does it through a shliach of an enemy, and we want to remove it. So what we do over here, we say that we do the hirats and that the Kedush should remove it. The question is, what and how is this going to help us go and remove the, uh, the, uh, um, this power from this enemy? So we, we know that if someone does a sin, there is two ways to remove that sin. And by removing the sin, you're removing the power behind that sin, which is the, um, which is the, uh, the angel that, that gives that power. So there's a way that you could do a tshuva, a repentance out of fear, and you could do repentance out of love. What has the greater power to remove this angel? Obviously, if you do repentance out of love, tshuva out of love. Now, what happens if, you created a you created a sin, and now you created a, you, you you did a sin. You created an angel, and now this angel has power, and you do tshuva out of love. That angel all flips around and turns to as if you did a mitzvah, meaning it takes the sin that you did, and it transforms it into a a mitzvah. So imagine somebody's at level zero, and they did a sin, and it brought them to the level negative ten. When they do tshuva out of love, not only does it go back to zero. It goes to positive 10. It turns it into a positive thing. So imagine somebody goes and eats something not kosher. And they do tshuva out of love. All of a sudden, it's as if they ate the best hechsher sandwich with the best kavanas to do the best mitzvahs with that power from that. Meaning that it transforms the sin into a positive commandment. It completely reverts it. And that's by doing tshuva out of love. Now... Let's try to see what is the connection over here. We started off with dip the apple in the honey. Make a bracha loud and clear. Right? We're saying the bracha of the Torah is represented by the... What connection? We're, we're, we're dipping the apple in the honey. Then we're all of a sudden, right after that, we're asking for, you know, the destruction of our enemies. How is one thing connected to another? So Reb Chaim Velazhen, in Nefesh Chaim, in the fourth shah, says, how do you get to tshuva out of love? How is it possible to do tshuva out of love? Re, says the Reb Chaim Velashen, and Nefesh Chaim, that it is impossible. Let me repeat that. It is impossible to do tshuva out of love without studying Torah. And in fact, the Zohar says that someone who is far from Torah is far from Hashem. Someone who is close to Torah is close to Hashem. So, and, and the Chai Adam goes further and says, without a connection to Torah, you do not have a connection to Hashem. And the Shari Tshuva in the first chapter says that the sin of failing to study Torah is more severe than all the other sin. Because the connection that one has to Torah is equals the connection that one has to HaKadosh Baruch to God. And there's a passage in Devarim, chapter 30, verse 11. Ki mitzvah hazois, this mitzvah, what, which mitzvah? We'll soon see. Asher anoichi mitzvah hayon, that I command you today, says HaKadosh Baruch says God. It's not concealed from you. And it's not far away. The Ramban, Nachman Riz, goes and explains that this is referring to the mitzvah of tshuva. It's not, it's not concealed from you, and it's not far from you. However, the Ramban, in a different location, a different place, says that this is referring to the mitzvah of Torah study. So the, Mepharsha, uh, the people ask, wait a minute, the, the rabbis ask, how could it be you're saying that this mitzvah, in Devarim, chapter 30, verse 11, ki a mitzvah is ice. this is a mitzvah, at one point you're saying it's Torah, at another point you're saying it's tshuva, it can't be both, it has to be either one or or. But the answer is that it is both, why is it both? Because tshuva and Torah are interconnected. The primary way to you people can do tshuva is through Torah study. And the Shlab brings us the other way around. Listen to this. The Shlab says if someone's trying to learn, the Shlab says if someone's trying to learn Torah and they find it too difficult to comprehend, it's a sign that there is a sin that's preventing the connection between them and the Torah. Meaning that if you want to understand Torah, you have to do tshuva. If you want to do proper tshuva, you have to learn Torah. They're both, both interconnected. You have to do both of them simultaneously. You want to do tshuva out of love? You have to go and you have to learn Torah. And the Gemara in Sukkah, page 52b, says that if you, the Yetzirah encounters you, the evil inclination encounters you, what should you do? Bring it to the base of Medrash. 
Why are you going to bring it to the base of Madrash? Because the Gemara and Kedushin, Daflam and the page 30b, tells us that Barasi Yetzahara, Barasi Tara Tavlin, I created the evil inclination, but I created the Torah as its antidote. The Torah is its antidote. So let's look at this beautiful thing. You should be dancing after you hear this. This is crazy. We start off with dip the apple in the honey. What do we say? The apple eats chayim. He eats as a tree, like an apple tree. Eats chayim mila machazikiba. An apple is what represents the Torah hakadosh. It represents the Torah. If you have the apple, and then what happens? You have the apple. You have the honey. The honey is the sweetness. What type of chuba do you do? What type of chuba do you do? You're doing chuba out of love, out of ahava. How do you do chuba out of you know out of love? Only through learning Torah. So once you start off, and remember, we start off. The first thing that most people do is dip the apple in the honey. You start off saying the Torah is everything, and you dip it into the honey, and that's the chuba. You make it chuba the sweet. What's the sweet? That's out of love, not out of fear. Out of fear, you're not putting it. You're putting it maybe in vinegar or something else. But you're doing chuba out of sweetness, out of love, out of happiness. So what happens over here? Then we go and we say that we, that we want our, 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 all our enemies to be destroyed, everything to be disconnected. But how? What? I'm going to say he ruts and I'm going to be able to do all that? The answer is, wait a minute. If you go and you did the first thing, if you did the tshuva, if you did the Torah learning out of, out of love, then you're going to have the tshuva out of love. And if you have the tshuva, then what's going to happen is that then their enemies are going to be destroyed. How are your enemies going to be destroyed? Because how do your enemies have any power? Because of your sins. Your sins are connected to the angel above. The angel above that you connected with your sins. But when you do tshuva out of love, all of a sudden that angel becomes a good angel and if it becomes a good angel it doesn't have any more power to the enemies and hence the enemies are going to be destroyed so this is why we start off dip the apple in the honey make a bracha loud and clear because if you have that then the rest is going to fall like dominoes if you have taira and if you have tshuva then guess what your enemies don't stand a chance so we'll leave you with that that this year Merakadish Baruch give us the power the ability to really understand what's the apple and the honey, to do tshuva out of love. And how are we going to do tshuva out of love? By doubling down on our learning, by increasing our learning Torah. And when we increase that, that tremendous amount of bracha that's going to come for that is going to be tshuva out of love. And when tshuva out of love, all our enemies are going to fall into the West Side. And with that, we will open up to any questions. There shouldn't be any questions. I think there's no questions. Right? It's awesome. Like, you, like, are you, like... It's, it's so beautiful. No, it, you should be dancing right now. Like, it is so beautiful. You should really say thank you, Hashem, for this gift, this beautiful gift of Torah, what, of what we were able to uncover tonight. Unbelievable. Okay, but we see we don't have any questions, which is good because I don't have any time to answer them. Anyways. What about? Oh, we do have a question. Okay. For, for women, who, how do we learn Torah? Women are allowed to learn Torah. What's wrong with women learning Torah? I'm saying we're so busy with kids and, and working. Right, so the women have, don't have the same, the same level of Torah obligation as men. And obviously your putter from it, uh, we'll, we'll sp the, really this is going to be a part two of what I wanted to speak about. Because if you want to do something, but you don't have the ability to do this is really, this is a spoiler alert for the next time we do the next, uh, the continuation of the series. That if you want to do something, but you can't do something, you get reward as if you did it. So... If someone's busy with kids and they can't sit and they can't learn and they, can, they don't have the ability, uh, maybe they have the ability to listen to class here and there, the, if they want to do it, they still have that same connection and the same power to it. They get, they get that, that same reward for it. But of course, a woman is also obligated to learn. How is a woman going to learn? How, 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 they, they have to learn certain things. They don't have the same obligation as a man, but the power within it lies the same as a man. And if they can't do to it because of unforeseen circumstances, circumstances of, of blessings of, of kids, they are not held liable, obviously, and the, the blessing will still stand. Okay. Thank you all for joining, and until, we should say until next year, until next year, may you all be inscribed for an amazing, amazing Siva V'chasim a year full of bracha, atzlacha, siyata deshmaya, parnasa, a tremendous amount of spiritual growth, and everything that, Baruch, that you ask for HaKadosh Baruch Hu can grant you for the good, and not only that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should grant you what you want before you even ask it.